Joining me now on the Knicks Film School podcast, uh, he is a returning guest. Uh, but I mean, listen, there's the there's the I imagine this is how it feels. There is the before you are a published author and there's the after you are a published author. And uh, today, literally today, because we are recording this at 5 p.m. on January 18th, um, today's returning guest can now um, officially say that he is a published author. You know him from, of course, the Wall Street Journal, from uh, ESPN, from 538, from Source Illustrated, um, and from being just generally one of the good guys, if not the best guy. And now the author of Blood in the Garden, the flagrant history of the 1990s New York Knicks, Chris Herring. Hello, sir. You you always do that whenever you have me on the show with the, the intro where it's like... <laughs> Michael Buffer doesn't introduce people the way you do. Um, <laughs> Can so I just I appreciate I have, that? I have to say one more thing. You sure. we were talking again. I told you to save it for the pod because I this is what I want to say to you. You were like, all these people are are tagging you in this not, and you're like, oh my god, I can't retweet everybody. People are going to hate me because I'm not retweeting them. You don't have to worry about that because everybody knows you, and you're the fucking man. And not because like yes, you're the man, but like because you're a good guy. And like, that's why, like you wrote a book that I already told you was already in my Mount Rushmore for, for hoops books and that, and people will read it for that reason and they will buy it and they will love it for that reason. But like, like the, the notion that people could have a hand in Chris Herring's success because you are who you are like, no, like, like people just want to be happy for you, dude. Like that, that take that in. I think that's what overwhelms me actually is uh, it's, it's, it's overwhelming to, uh, to feel that kind of love all at once. I didn't expect to break down <laughs> the first interview I've done this for. It's just, um, it's a lot to see it all at the same time. And I'm just grateful, legitimately grateful. Thank you. Um, thank you for agreeing to make this your first interview. Um, on again, the day of the launch, I know we talked about it last time when you talked about the process and today we're obviously going to talk about the book. Um, how many, how many, how long has this been now in the works, uh, up, up to date? You know what? I, let me see if I could find it really quick since obviously I'm on my computer. Yeah. The day I announced the book was that I was working on the book. I'm pretty sure it was like January 28th of 2019 so we're basically three it's like basically three years well it's almost almost three years to the day give or take a few weeks like yeah you and again we talked about this a lot last time so i don't want to go over old old stuff again but but to do this the way and and again i it's not that i didn't know it was going to be great but then to sit there and read it and be like oh my god this person just dedicated their life to this thing for three years to dedicate yourself to that, um, to something. And, and, and again, you talked about last time, how this may have affected, you know, a relationship and like other aspects of your life to now right. finally be here on this day. I mean, obviously you're overwhelmed, but is there, is there some relief? Is that, I mean, you just take, how are you feeling about it, man? Um, it's my head spinning. Honestly, I mean, I'm trying to, <laughs> Trying to make everything work, uh, the logistics of everything, you know, the excerpts, one of them went up a little bit late today and I was like, what's going on with that? So there's lawyers involved with oh. making sure that it's legal for them to run the excerpt. So it's it's a okay. lot of weird stuff. It's also just trying to make sure that, you know, I make all my calls and and get to all the calls and everything like that. But it's 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 such a blessing. None of it is a complaint. None of it is a complaint. It's just it's uh, <laughs> the spike thing. I mean, all of it is overwhelming, but that is like. A week ago, the man didn't know who I was, you know, and um, <laughs> now it's like, I mean, I don't know. Some people noticed it even on Sunday um, during the Georgetown St. John's game. They're like, I see you sitting next to Spike at the game. And then other people noticed it yesterday. Like, I see you sitting next to Spike at the game. The, the man wants me to sit next to him at Nick's game. And it's like, it's it's just, it's a lot. They're like, the, the fact that he wants to do a book event with me that like, I I essentially don't have to ask him. He's like, I want to do that. Um, He's that passionate about this. He loved the book that much. He read the book in essentially one sitting on a night that the Knicks had a game, by the way, he finished the book (laughs) on Wednesday. He got the book on Wednesday 
he has a personal assistant that went to high school with me, like small world. Oh, wow. Um, that was how the book got on his radar is that my high school classmate kept seeing me post and retweet pictures that other people are posting in the book. And she finally said, Spike, did you know about this book? Have you already read it? Do you already have it? And he said, go find me that book. I mean, he's in the book. Obviously, his reference goes without saying I reached, prominently. I, I reached to, out to him for the book. I mean, he's, he's, like you said, he's in the book, but I didn't interview him because when I reached out to his people and I got a response from him, but he was like, that wasn't me. So I'm sure he has publicity people that like yeah. essentially uh, gatekeep and assume that he wouldn't want to do the interview. And he was like, who did you get the email from? And I was like, I, you know. <laughs> I, I, I sent it to you when I was at a different job, so I'm not even sure I still have the email, but um, he, he seemed a little frustrated about that. I was about to say, I hope that person different. still has a job. <laughs> yeah, like I, I kind of don't want to reveal who it is, even if I had it, but <laughs> yeah. um, I don't want to get the person in trouble. But he was like, it's taken aback that I tried to interview him as, as you know, it was funny because I was like, no, I knew that. And I figured that he would want to talk to me. He, uh, to you know, to put it bluntly, I think he likes dealing with young black people. Uh, he's always been really big on that. Uh, it's really important to him. And uh, so I figured he would be open to talking to me. I've dealt, I've talked to him before. He doesn't, he wouldn't remember that. But um, when I was on the next beat before I, you know, okay. he's an important person to know and talk to. So he, he's always, even, even when I was at the wall street journal, he, uh, he, I asked to interview him one time. We had like a two minute conversation. Then I was like, you know, is it okay if I ask you some questions? And he was like, remind me what outlet you're with again. And I was like the wall street journal. He's like, ah, ah can't do it. He, he won't do interviews with Rupert Murdoch owned publications, uh, uh, which okay, I mean, like, could I really blame you? So, um, yeah. so, you know, I, I, but like, it was still very clear that he had an admiration for me as a young black man working at a big outlet. It's not, it's not common. It's certainly not common with regards to basketball. It's not really common with anything. And I've had that reaction from Jim Brown. I've had the reaction from plenty of people that are, you know, black, people that are in any major industry, it's written, you know, the higher up you get, the more rare it is to see it. So I think he would have done the interview with me. And it was interesting because like, I didn't push for it during the book because it's like, you know, you don't, you're not owed anything because you're a black man, but I think he would have been more likely to do it had he known or that, you know, I don't know, maybe his publicist didn't know I was black either, but either way, he, he seemed kind of flustered or not flustered, frustrated that um, it wasn't brought to his attention that I wanted to interview him for the book, but he, he loved the book. Um, I, I'm going to, I'll try to keep it to, I'm going to try to keep it to basketball, but try to keep it to the book. Cause I don't want you to, I want to make this easy <laughs> okay. and pleasant and pleasurable for you, you know, Okay. <laughs> but I, I will just say one more time um, from the bottom of my heart. Congratulations. Uh, Thank it's, you so much. It's, it's, um, and I'll say congratulations because, and I, I I'll transition by saying like, Anyone who puts their mind to it can can write a book, right? It, it, it can be done. Um, and it's, you could do some interviews and try to find some, you know, and uncover something. Um, and there are a lot of books about basketball and the NBA and, and some books about the Knicks out there. And I, when I thought of this book about this team, um, I, there was a small part of me that I'm like, I, I, I was like, I hope... I hope I love it as much as I want to love it. And my doubt was because I'm like, I lived this. This is my blood. This is my core. This is my sweat. I'm like, I didn't want to open it up and be like, oh, well, okay. This is just a, a little fun fact here and there, but I, I knew all this already. Right. Chris, when I tell you that this was like reading a story about, not a story about people like I didn't know, but like it is it, it, the only way I could compare it to um, is like people who are like fascinated with the Royal family. Right. And imagine someone was able to like do a, a true tell all book about the most prominent members from the most prominent period of the Royal family. Oh, wow. history. And I, when I, uh, Chris, man, you got into it and I don't, and, but it's, and, 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 I'm, and then I'm going to get to some specific stuff. Cause I don't want to keep uh, your heads. I don't want to blow it up too much, but <laughs> it's not too late. <laughs> no, but it's not, but here's the thing. You didn't just uncover stuff. And like I have here, I'm going to, for our YouTube people. And I limited myself. This, this is my notes. <laughs> 
and I and that looks again, like Breen's play by play stuff. Oh my god, forget about it. And this could have been three or four pages, but I'm like, no, I got to limit myself to only the stuff. That, and then I had to go through it again today and narrow it to the stuff that I want to ask you about. Oh wow, there's t- there's tons of t- like if you're just someone that like just wants tidbits about the team that you grew up rooting for or, or, or anything, there's all that. But the way you tell this story, and this is the first question I want to ask you actually about the about the book, were you in in, in I don't know how to say it. in crafting it as a narrative. What was that process like? And, and did that happen as you were still doing the reporting or did you kind of get everything? And you're like, cause you're so great about like, okay, I'm going to put the Mason part in here and the Ewing, like, you know, work ethic part in here. And the, the story about Starks when he was a kid in here, like that must've been an undertaking all, all unto itself. Yeah, no. Well, thank you for, kind of appreciating that um, because to me, that's the hardest part. Um, like the last dance people watched it and I, I, I thought it was good. If, if nothing else, I thought it was at least very entertaining to watch the last dance. <laughs> it was very but, entertaining. You know, people, people would complain. I complained at one point. It was only once that I complained, but I was like the, the way they're telling the story is starting to confuse me a little bit. It, you know, they obviously were going, they started from the very end of it. And they would kind of they were meeting in the middle, essentially, yeah. between the beginning of his career and telling a story at the beginning of his career, but starting from the very end of it and kind of working their way in the middle. And I remember at one point I got confused because I think there was one year where the, the Bulls played the Pacers and they played the Jazz. But remember, they were meeting in the middle. And so at a certain point, there were two years in a row that they played, I think, both of those teams. Yeah, and so it was right. like, I'm trying to remember which finals this is. Like, it was a little bit confusing. though. It wasn't their fault, but it was just the way they did it. So for me, I was like, okay, now I see what the challenge with that documentary was because you have the challenge of trying to tell people's personal stories, but you're also trying to tell the story in chronological order from one season to the next. So like, do you focus on the season or do you focus on the people? And when do you kind of transition it? It would probably be like changing gears with a car. (laughs) Um, and, And in my mind, it was like, okay, I've got each of these seasons and here's, I I ultimately know what happens with each season, whose story fits best in each spot. And, you know, the thing I keep going back to and keep explaining to people had to explain to my own agent at one point, you'll notice that the chapter about Patrick Ewing is chapter 17. Yeah. Yep. Uh, It's really, really rare for a chapter about the superstar to be, you know, one of the last five chapters of the book, which it is here. The reason I did that was because, Okay, you know, if I put him at the beginning of the book, that's fine. But one, uh, Patrick's been there for six years already, and he's not really the new character when the book opens. Pat Riley is. Uh, and then the first sentence of the book is essentially devoted. I mean, not the prologue, but the first sentence of the first chapter is devoted to Pat Riley. First few paragraphs are because he's the new person. He's the catalyst. Him and Dave Checkins, I don't want to sell that short, are the, the, the catalyst for the organization changing. As you know from reading the book, Patrick Ewing was ready to leave at the beginning of the book. And I do and mention a list that of at teams. the beginning of the book. Yeah, he, had a, he literally handed Riley a list of teams he wanted to go to, six teams. So, like, that was, if anything, that was the light in which Ewing needed to be recognized. And I did. He was there. And, you know, because of that, in the second chapter, uh, being talked about in that way and that being explained. But to me, I wanted to capture each important part of each season. I wanted to cover each key player from that era and coach. And I wanted to do it while each person was in some form of transition. Mm. And to me, Patrick Ewing wasn't going through a change. The only change he's going through is like, oh, I guess I am going to stay with the Knicks. I mean, he was ready to leave. <laughs> So I mentioned that at the beginning for that reason and tie it into Riley because at one point Riley was saying, I'm not going to come to the Knicks if Patrick's trying to leave. So I tie those two things together and you get some of Patrick there in the second chapter. But other than that, you get to base. I mean, Patrick was an established superstar for all those years. And then you get to 97 and he shatters his wrist. And then a month after that, it's put out there that he's having an extramarital affair with a team dancer and it unravels his marriage. And shortly after that, he becomes the president of the Players Association at a time where there's going to be a lockout. Like, these are all very big things in his life that matter a lot, that, you know, that impact him on a personal level, that probably change him somewhat on a personal level, that to me, uh, you know, a career-altering wrist injury, uh, 
uh, it changes the the course of the franchise. So of course it's like that. That's him in transition. Him from ninety one to ninety six. I mean, there are bits and pieces, and I report on those things and present them. But that's not him in transition. So for me, that was my challenge, and I kept thinking about. I was like, where is everybody's story most impactful? For Ewing, it's there, in my opinion, at least within this story. It, no, it, it, it starts. It, is. To, it starts to tell you why he wanted to leave, in my opinion, because like he's underappreciated, and I get into some of that. He feels underappreciated. He's an aging star for a franchise that he's carried for 12, 13, 14 years by that point. So that's him in transition, starting to kind of come to grips with some of that, particularly once he doesn't have the full use and range of his wrist anymore. So that was why I placed that there. When you talk about Oakley, I ended up putting him early in the book because it's like, okay, if you're explaining the way that Pat Riley wants them to play defense and the way he wants them to be physical, you can do that through Charles Oakley. So strategically, you can put him early because he is their strategy in terms of the way he plays basketball. Um, and then if you're going to contrast what Oakley's doing, guess what? Guess who does that very well? Charles Smith. Uh, so you talk poor, about who doesn't fit in with that style of play. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and by the way, like he was the guy that, as I'm reporting this out, the people I knew the least about, he was probably at the top of the list. And I, you know, and I, I think I paint a humanizing portrait of him, but I also, you just were like, kind. Man, like he, he had a rough go and Riley did not make it easy on him. Not that it's his job to, but I kind of feel like Riley, someone, someone from the Miami heat organization um, asked me the other day. Um, first of all, his book is great. Secondly, if, if I send you a copy or can you send me a copy that you already have and uh, sign it out to Pat? Oh, wow. And I was like, are you sure Pat wants a copy of this book? <laughs> um, because I mean, this, this book is uh, it's not, it doesn't really, it's not unfair. I don't think I certainly, I, don't, well, I, I wasn't trying to be unfair anyway. We're going to get to Pat uh, very soon. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's not easy on Pat Riley at all. And there's a lot of stuff about it where I'm like, yo, this is a, uh, you know, like a lot of stuff, particularly as it relates to Charles Smith specifically that I just think makes Pat look a little bit bad, at least a little bit bad. And, and at least does not have him come off looking well. Um, but no, anyway, the reason I was trying to do that, Charles Smith fits after Oakley because, okay, he's kind of the black swan in a group that's all physical. Okay, clearly we're going to put Stark somewhere around the NBA finals because he was the story of those yep. finals. We're going to put Mason right before the finals because he almost wasn't, or we're going to put him right before the playoffs because he was almost kept off the playoff roster. So yeah. let's talk about his personality there. I'm trying to think who else. Van Gundy, obviously, you know, when he starts coaching the team, Don Nelson, when he starts yep. coaching the team. But to me, that's the way I wanted to do that. And then with all the other guys, because I mostly focus on the first half of the decade, guys, you had Alan Houston and Larry Johnson come in at the same time. And then you had Marcus Camby and uh, Latrell Sprewell Latrell Sprewell, yeah. at the same time. But, you know, so their stories were easier to tell. But all of those things are with people and with the team in clear transition. And that was how I wanted to order the story. And it, I, I had to just kind of trust that I could find a way to wed those storylines and their backgrounds and their histories within the course of the team and its season and what was happening with their season. And I had to go back and rewrite the whole thing, not the whole thing, but chapter by chapter. I would say each chapter I took a crack at three or four times to rewrite wow. them. So I've written the book three or four times, but I'm doing that because this doesn't flow well enough. This doesn't really connect. And there were spots where it was difficult. Like you'll remember that there was one chapter where I basically reel off what happened during Anthony Mason proposing to his girlfriend. Yeah. But they're like, I thought, first of all, you handled it well um, there. That was it, it too. It needed to be. I, if you knew that it needed to be in there, like you could not have that in there it, because it talks I almost, about it. I was going to pull it. Like, really? I didn't see it as a, I didn't know if it was a perfect fit. And I had a, a really close friend of mine. I won't put on blast because you know everybody has a different opinion. I said, do you kind of feel like this fits? Cause I used that as a way to get into basically trust issues, but also, okay, now I'm at a point where I'm ready to commit to you. And it's saying, not okay, gratuitous. Now the Knicks were ready to commit to Pat Riley. It, yes. And Pat Riley's not sure if he wants to commit back. Basically. So I've wedded those two issues. I don't know if they're, I had a, a close friend who I, you know, really value the person's opinion who said, I, yeah, I don't really know if that fits the other. I, I see what you're doing, but I don't know if it fits. So I, I had questions about it, but I used it partly because of what you said, because it's like, I think most people would like to see details, crazy details about Anthony Mason rolling up at three in the morning with his music blaring, coming down the streets of Queens, 
proposing to his girlfriend, you know, at, right after the NBA finals, a couple of days after the NBA finals, a day, whatever it was. Um, so I wanted to use it. If it wasn't there, I don't know if it makes it in the book. But anyway, it's, it's really hard to your question about trying to synthesize everything. That was what took me the longest amount of time to do, even more than the reporting after a while. I was just like, does this read well? Does this make sense? Can you see why I'm drawing this connection between these two things? And um, I spent a lot of time on it. It shows. Um, you did it beautifully. Uh, just on Ewing, because I, I don't, you know, it, it's funny. Uh, he was, I don't know, you you probably have, have a better opinion on this than me. I think he was probably underappreciated during his time here. And the way, the way you told that part of his story, the 96, 97, 98, like towards the end there, um, you know, when you tell this great story about how it, he he's in whatever he is in year 12, 13 of his career and younger guys are getting into the gym and who's the, who's there. And there's, I think you, you mentioned the detail. There's already a, a sweat shirt soaked shirt off to the side that he's already like sweated through and he's moved on to the next one. And this is already before anybody else is even in the gym. Um, and this is a guy who's already a hall of famer, like undisputed hundred percent. Um, and that's what kind of work ethic he had. And, and, you know, the other challenge and you kind of alluded to it a few times already, none of these um, characters, including players and coaches, like everybody, none of them were choir boys, um, you know, and these are these are real people like these are actual living like human beings. And you handled all of that, all of the other stuff, I thought, in a way that was both genuine and also uh, fair, uh, you know. Like, and that's, it, it, it never detracted me, um, from the story. Um, I want to go back to Riley. I, I think like you're the narrator of, of the book. If the book has a narrator, it's almost like check it's because check it's kind of appears like through he, like from day one to, to the last day. Riley to me is the main character. Oh, he absolutely is. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and 100%. I was, and I, I, I look, I don't know what, this says about me. I'm one of those people that like, when I think of, I'm just gonna be honest. When I think of like my image of like, what is a man? What does what does it mean to be a man? You know, a, a, a you know, a, 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 uh, a guy who like has it together and he's like, you know, exudes this image of like, Pat, like all the shit we're taught as, as young boys growing up. Right. In my head, it's Pat Riley. And you uncover layers of him here which I don't think have ever quite been uncovered. I, th there's a couple of points. I just, I'm, there's so much, I have a whole section on like Riley, but so I'm going to go to this one part. It's early on in the book and you talk about, he's getting them ready for uh, a game, a key game six, I believe it, against the bulls when they lost right. to, to seven. I'm just going to, I'm going to read. Um, <laughs> my goodness. So he shows them the video of Jordan, faking out um, basically half the team and then dunking over Ewing. And then you write for somewhere between five and 10 minutes while the team sat in stunned silence, Riley showed the exact same play with Jordan schooling three of the next best players on their home floor, displaying the low light on a loop. It was a clockwork orange style of version therapy with Riley forcing his players to repeatedly watch their mind, their misdeed. When the coach finally hit the stop button, he paced in front of the TV briefly to find the words he wanted to say. This makes me sick to my stomach. He finally snarled. Um, and then he goes on to talk about how they need to knock Michael Jordan on his ass in that game. And uh, they won the game. Coming out of this, did your opinion of Riley change? Is it, is it just like emboldened to whatever degree it already was? Like, what are your thoughts about Riley after writing this book? Uh, from that standpoint, I just think everything I heard, I just got more and more the impression that it was true as far as just like how cutthroat he was as a yeah. coach. Uh, the idea that he, you know, I'll put it this way. My book editors at one point, uh, you might remember, I don't know if you would, you know, if you find that tweet from three years ago when, when we announced the book, uh, I had said, you know, blood on the hardwood was what we would call it, uh, just tentatively. Um, my editors were, you know, they, my agent were kind of like, why don't we just go simpler? Why don't we do no layups allowed? Which, you know, from those teams, like, would be fitting. And my answer, I was like, uh, and they were like, why, why don't you like that? And I said, well, if we're being honest, Riley 
actually uttered that phrase for the first time when he was coaching the Lakers. He told the Lakers that. So, like, I think that the the offense overshadowed that stuff. You know, the Showtime era offense overshadowed that he was still a tough minded coach then and got them to play defense then. Um, but like, if you knew Riley as a player, which I obviously didn't, we're we're too young. Uh, he was a, a, a tough nosed player. He was responsible for guarding Jerry West every day. Um, so you're that right about that, by the way. You're, right, and that was yeah. absolutely the way he wanted to to coach. And I think the difference was okay. The, the Knicks don't have the offensive talent that the Lakers do, so we have to we have to kind of build this into our ethos. We have to be physical. We need to make teams fear us. And there was a a legitimate fear factor where, I mean, you from reading that chapter in that same section that you've been talking about with knock, knock, knocking Michael Jordan to the floor, Michael shortly after that here's the messaging that Riley is using with the media. And he essentially says, I I can't wait for this series to be over. This is a nightmare. And they're trying to take my head off. And he's being completely serious. And not to mention, not just to say that, but Michael shot basically as poorly as he had ever shot in that game because he wasn't willing to go to the basket. Like he was losing the ball with nobody around him. Like, Like he looked like a receiver that heard the footsteps coming. Um, and the way, you know, the, the comparison, the analogy I make is that it was like a game of minesweeper where like, okay, you were safe for that one step, but you're not sure if you're going to make the next one without somebody blowing you up. And that was the way it felt looked. That was the way he was talking about it. And that was what Riley told the Knicks to do because they didn't have the same talent that the Bulls had. That was the only chance they had was to shake Michael up and to make him fear them. And then they did, um, not enough to beat him, but (laughs) Nobody was beating him during that era anyway. So it's nothing to be ashamed of. And that's what I don't get the impression of, you know, like, oh, why would you write about the Knicks from that era? They didn't win anything. Okay, so we're only supposed to hear bull stories then, I guess. Like (laughs) maybe a couple of rockets ones thrown in there. Okay, like hear it from his perspective, which we have 10 times over. So I think it's okay to get the flip side of it to see a team that pushed them, didn't beat them, but pushed them. And um, the Knicks had a different way about going about it. I guess it was, you know, piston centric sort of way that they went about it, but they had a younger team than the Pistons did. Um, and that was what Riley was banking on to try to beat them and almost did it. But I guess your question was, did my opinion of Riley change? Yes. In some ways, I think the more I did on this, I think I realized that uh, I don't think anymore that Pat could have lasted much longer as the Knicks coach. I, I really don't. I'm so happy you said that. And I, I want to get to the departure stuff, but 1000%, okay. 1000%. I, I, I just don't, you know, I, I, so that part of my perception changed uh, because I've been in the same place. I think a lot of Nick fans are with that is like, how can what you if they had given him ownership and like, we'll get, we can get into that, but like, so we'll get to it later. Yeah. But yeah, I don't think that could have worked. I mean, like you could have given him ownership. I'm sure he would have found a way to stay at that point, but like he would have needed to go into management. I think even sooner than he did with Miami, because he seemed like he was burning out really fast. Like, just a shooting star as far as just the, how fleeting it was because he, he had his foot on the pedal so hard all the time in a way that it's just like, I think it was wearing down the players, but I think it was wearing down Riley even more than the players. So that was what changed in my perception. Uh, he comes across as a bit crazy, like just, you know, straight up. I just don't know. Like uh, the, uh, I don't know how else to describe it other than like, he he seemed like a man with no off switch. Like mm-hmm. he needed to be this other world. Like I, I he, he was almost like not even, I, I don't know how it's like, he wasn't even human. Like the way you tell it, it's like his entire existence was dedicated to getting every last drop out of this team that he had. And it, the, the way the, what I come away from it reading, and it sounds like you may maybe come away from the same thing, writing it, is that it got to a point where it just kind of maybe not mentally broke him or like emotionally broke him or something, but like, I'm just, I'm going to go back to, to what you wrote. So um, after they lose in the playoffs in uh, 1995, the the finger roll game um, in game seven, and you tell the story with Riley getting on the bus and within earshot of, of players. And he gets on the phone um, and he gets on the phone with a friend of his who was connected with the heat. And he says, are you still friendly with the guy who owns the heat? He asks Patera. Yeah, I am. He's a good guy. Why? Riley says, because I'm done. I'm just done. Riley responded. All I could tell you is I'm finished in New York. 
And this is before, and you go through it all, all of the contract stuff, all of, and my God, is that, is that good reporting? Um, I don't want to spoil it all, but you go, and, and there's all a whole song and dance that happens after that, but it seemed like he just, he was it. That was it. He was done. Yeah. I mean, I think at a certain point too, how can I say this without incriminating myself? Like I had, I mean, I was working really hard. I'll put it this way. Maybe this is fair. Maybe this is human nature to some extent. So maybe Riley's not a bad guy from the way I'm going to view it or perceive it. But, you know, when 538 and ESPN were chasing me at the Wall Street Journal, there was a certain point where it's like, okay, they're making it very clear that they're about to pay me in a very different way than I'm paid now. I didn't mean it was going to be easy to leave the Knicks beat. So that might be the difference between Riley and me. But um, at a certain point, you start, you don't, I don't know, you don't necessarily mentally check out, but you're like, okay, I'm very ready to go to this next thing. Particularly, let's say if the Wall Street Journal, if, if I perceive that the Wall Street Journal has promised me certain things, those things are just looming and you're waiting for them. Think about it. He thought his friend was going to buy the heat in February. and January, they were talking about doing that. Then February comes around and he's like, oh, we didn't quite get it. Like you had your hopes up for essentially a promotion somewhere else and leaving to go somewhere else. And then it didn't happen. So you got your hopes up that way. You got your hopes up for potential ownership with the Knicks. They say no. And I go through that disappointment that he feels when he walks out of the office of the team's owner, basically uh, Rand Aristotle. So he's gotten his hopes up basically two times already. And then, you know, they lose to the Pacers. That's part of what I wonder about. If I wonder about anything is like, what if the Knicks, win it that year Ooh. or what if they'd won it in 94 do things change the stuff ease up a little bit is there more resolve there to kind of deal with whatever it is do you have to deal with anything at all are you just willing to give them ownership at that point are you willing to open up that conversation with the championship i don't know but he was already viewed as i mean he was already viewed as a god right kind of in a you oh know? for sure By yeah fans and stuff absolutely yeah yeah <sighs> Yeah, I don't. Does it make I don't, you maybe more able to put up with them as a player? You know, because I think he was wearing on the players at that point too. I, Even though I think they respected him, uh, Mason was was a little bit of a wild card in their respect, but he still respected uh, <laughs> Riley. But it, it's just I don't. To me, that's the question. I think that's worth asking more so than like, what if they never let him go? I think it's more yeah. like, what if they won earlier before some of the stuff spirals the way it did. And, and just briefly before we move on from Riley, the um, was it ten thousand dollars? That <laughs> yeah. So uh, let me see if I can characterize this correctly. He uh, in a, another section of the book that's just great is when he, I guess, sensed or maybe an assistant coach said to him, like, was like, listen, these guys are about to break that the team was kind of at a mental breaking point. He took them all to Reno. Um, uh, surprising them. Right. He did like they, they knew they were going to Reno when like the plane touched down. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, they got into the casino, um, gave them all chips. I guess he, he spent $10,000 and then he, uh, I don't know how you say it, put in for that money from his, from his, from the powers that be uh, that employed him. And uh, as you tell it, it, it never got back to him. And clearly it is something that he never forgot. And I wonder almost, it's funny. You brought up the battles with Jordan Jordan, you know, famously in his Hall of Fame speech, like you could tell like, oh, chips, these imaginary otherwise chips on this guy's shoulder is what's been driving him for all these years. I wonder if there's a little bit of that with Riley, too, you know? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll put it this way. Riley, um, we obviously have to think about the way he left the team, which I think, you know, and I said this in a, uh, I said this earlier, I think the way Riley left is a little overblown, not that he left and it was clearly tampering. Like I get that people are upset about that still. I think it's more like the fax machine thing. Um, I think the Knicks really uh, like kind of were almost like a pig in mud while people were just tarring and feathering Riley for that yeah. because the Knicks essentially knew he was leaving. They made a big deal about the fax and played into it. Like everybody's like, Oh my God, he faxed in his resignation. The Knicks knew that they knew that he was leaving. Like yeah. Ernie Grunfeld had told Dave check to come around on the fact that like, Look, he's he's gone. You need to own up to that. Keep in mind, and you you read this in the book. Riley's agent tells Checkets that he's gone. He he tells him to wind this up yeah. so that we can get him out of his contract. He was essentially asking Checkets to let him have his release. Um, so Checkets knew he was gone. He was kind of hoping against hope at that point. Um, so there's that aspect of it too. I I, I think that deep down, uh, for Riley. 
I don't know. The ownership part of it is very, very interesting to me, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the Knicks, I'm not sure that they were going to find a way for him to stay at that point. And I think they knew that deep down. Um, and I'm not sure anything about it. What really would have changed it at that point. And they knew it. So yeah. it, it, Riley was made out to be the bad guy. And he was because he left in a way that he was going to another team was the issue. But even the Knicks people that I talked to say, well, damn, if we known you were going to get that sort of money, like they're <laughs> almost more frustrated with the fact that Riley had words for them on the way out because they're like, just say that you left for the money because yeah. everybody can understand that. But yes. you knew we couldn't do that for you. It wasn't what we were doing. It was what Miami was offering to do for you, which no one was going to meet that. Like that was unprecedented. It's still pretty much unprecedented at this point and years later. So that, that that's what I think some of what you hear from the Knicks is like they are glad and happy that people will really continue to shout Pat out of the building. But they also will acknowledge, like, I would have left for that, too. You know, even if and by the way, Miami did not pay a substantial penalty. It might have seemed like it at the time. Oh, no. made like a million in a draft pick or something like that. Yeah. Uh, OK. Like, it seems like that was a pretty well worth it sort of deal. <laughs> yeah, just a bit. Um, and, you know, and you also uh, make the point. Uh, I think it's I believe it's check. is quoted in saying, like, he thinks that Riley's distraction throughout the course of that season uh, cost the Knicks. And he wasn't doing as good a job as he could have been coaching, which, you know, who knows? And you and you have some. There might be validity some, to that. Yeah, I mean, you have the anecdote about the the golf clubs, right? Where, you know, this person who ate, you know, slept and you know, shat basketball, all of a sudden is like playing golf during his last season as the next coach, which is which is interesting. Right. Um, so good transition because uh, he's not the like the the first supporting character in this book, but he is like the guy who gets maybe ninth or tenth building billing, who is a character that I will never forget, and that's Don Nelson. And boy, do you have some do you have some Don Nelson stories in here? Um, the one that I picked that I wanted to bring up is uh, the Knicks are just suffered a and you and by the way, the back drop to this is like you tell all these stories about how when they would have uh, bad losses, it would like it, it would eat Riley up inside and it would eat the players up inside. And later on, you get into Van Gundy and uh, no surprise, similar stuff with him. Right. And then here's Don Nelson and they just got their ass kicked, I think by Milwaukee. And he, the players are like seething. They get on the plane and Don Nelson gets on the plane and you talk about how he tells the assistant coach at the time, I think it's, was it Jeff Nix? Um, yeah. Jeff Nix, like, Hey, I'm going to doze off for a few. Wake me when we land. And it's supposed to be like a three hour flight. And they go through one delay after another and it's, it ends up being like eight hours of travel. And then they, they get to their final destination and they're like pulling up on the tarmac. Um, and then Don, Don Nelson <laughs> wakes up. Uh, I, I have to read exactly what you wrote. Wow. Are we back already? What a short flight. <laughs> Nelson said earnestly. Um and then, and oh yeah, that's right. You also say at a certain point, I seriously thought he might be dead. That's Jeff Nix, the assistant coach. Um, similar question to Riley. What are your, what are your impressions about Don Nelson after doing the reporting here? Yeah. Um, that his mother at one point told him that she didn't think he should bother to go back coaching, uh, yeah. go back to coaching after losing the job in Golden State. And then essentially seemed like Don Nelson reached that conclusion himself by the end of the season, it seemed yeah. like he was like, why am I doing this to the point where I think some people started to question, like, is he trying to get fired with just, he was, I mean, thinking, thinking about it, he found himself at odds with Ewing, you know, I detail, not that it was my detail. Someone had reported this before very early, like in his first one-on-one -on -one meeting with Ewing, he found himself trying to motivate Ewing. Ewing was offended by the first thing he said to him, which was essentially Patrick, you're a great player. You do this, you do that. You know, all-time great scorer, all-time great jump shooter for your position. Um, you're a hell of a defender. You don't get enough credit in that regard. You do this, you know. You, you. But the one thing we really got to do, Patrick, like if you could just do this, you just run this league. If we could just make you a better passer. Mm -hmm. And Patrick responds by saying, "I I thought I already was a good passer." And and you're and they're off at that point, just like from the out of the gate, you know, Patrick is like, okay, this is not my guy. Not to mention that Don Nelson then asked Patrick and Charles Oakley to start bringing the ball up and training camp workouts and stuff like that, just to kind of diversify the offense a little bit, just a different look. 
Patrick looks really awkward doing that. He doesn't see the point in doing this. You know, he's he likes stuff the way it was before with Matt Riley. So there's that part of it. Um, and Nelly gets off to the bad start with Patrick. He used to coach John Starks before in Golden State. And John Starks grows to really despise Don Nelson and this run with the Knicks. He grows to despise him. Um, so really the only guy that's kind of on board with him of like the big three guys. And I mean, Mason theoretically should have loved Don Nelson because Anthony Mason is playing the most minutes in the league. Nope. Surprise. Anthony Mason leaves a death threat on your desk. Um, Which is one of the best one of the parts chapters. of the book. <laughs> a that literal death threat. Yes. Um, a literal death threat which is over playing time in a year where Anthony Mason is enjoying the most playing time in the whole league. Anthony Mason was a character. So, you know, of your top four guys, Ewing, Starks, Mason, Oakley, Oakley's the only one that is like kind of willing to hear Nelly out. Then Oakley gets hurt really the first time in that era that he had been hurt and out of the lineup. I think he had like a dislocated toe or something. They were trying to work him through. So he's out. And in that period where he's out, and I think they traded Herb Williams that year, they had like no leadership on the team that really respected Don Nelson. Oakley was the only guy that was okay with them. And then Oak was out of the lineup and just nobody. It was like a mutiny at that point. And actually do quote someone named Matt Fish in that chapter that basically says, uh, you ain't kicked my ass up and down the court in practice. And then sat out the next day for a game saying he was sick or that he was hurt. And it's like, you just kicked my ass and you're going to send me out there as a starter. Like these guys quit on Nelly and certain guys. I, I I don't doubt that they would even deny that. Like, you know, I'm not even sure that they would deny that. Um, but the truth is, and I have this in the chapter too, Nelly essentially quit on them too, where he's like, yeah. I'm so tired of these assholes. And he said he's, that within earshot of the players in a locker room. So we couldn't believe that. It. Yeah, I so, couldn't believe it. Um, he was over it. And, you know, I remember wanting to be really careful with that quote, which I think was from Willie Anderson. But then you get to the end of Don Nelson's tenure and he's quoted as saying, like, I loved everything about New York except for the players. So he didn't like the players. He was on record saying that in his exit press conference. So, you know, I, I, the, what I, my takeaway from Nelly was this, because I thought his chapter, I actually, we were, you, you try to use your best material your book excerpts when you're, you know, I had one in the New York Times, I had one at my old job at 538, I used one for Sports Illustrated. I was very close to, like, my editor was like, no, I don't use the Nelson chapter, because it's it's so long, and it's kind of so detailed, and so much of it is the context from Riley. But I, at one point, was, like, about to pitch that to places, because to me, Nelson's chapter was fascinating um, for all sorts of reasons. But what I was most fascinated by, again, if we talk about what ifs, Nelson, in theory, was, like, perfect for them. A guy that takes you his foot it. off the pedal. He's a visionary. Yeah. He was a visionary too in how the league he was going to be changing. Use, he wants to use Anthony Mason as a point forward. Okay, you'd see a whole lot of that in today's NBA. Yep. Um, he want and, and by the way, one of the reasons he wanted to do that is to take the ball out of Derek Harper's hands because Derek Harper is one of their best shooters. So he wanted to do the, do that. That's smart. He wanted to de-emphasize Patrick in the offense because Patrick's getting older. That's smart. He wants to practice them less hard because Riley was driving them into the ground. That's smart. And it's something mm -hmm. that we see a lot of today. He wanted to try to make them more of an offensive team as opposed to just being so reliant on winning through their defense. That's smart. You normally try to balance that out instead of just being a top. I mean, they were the best defense in the league for three years in a row with Riley. So that all was smart in theory. Um, but the thing is, I think he sucked at communicating all of it. <laughs> Not to mention the other thing he wanted to do was trade Patrick Ewing for Shaq which also would have been really smart, but <laughs> he really yeah. sucked at communicating all of it. And I think after a while he stopped even trying because he was like, I, I think he was just kind of over the job. And I, you know, I wanted to speak to him badly, but politely, you know, got a polite no in response to that. Similar to Riley where, you know, of all the places these guys have been all of fame coaches, um, you know, every coach has a stop where he's like not completely proud of how it went over. For Riley, it's not anything to be ashamed of. It's just that it's the one place he never won a championship. Yeah. Uh, for Don Nelson, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was kind of a, the way he felt about it was probably, you know, a humbling sort of thing. But after a while, I think he just didn't care because it was kind of like, okay, at this point, it's either me or him with Patrick. The word was out there that he had tried to, you know, suggest trading Patrick. It got back to Patrick. And at that point, Patrick probably did quit on him. And, and I think that's the, the excerpt that came out. Um, 
it was I, time run time runs together for me. Either a few weeks or a few months ago, and that got a lot of uh, publicity. The thing I was interested in um, is that the Knicks were in on trading for Alonzo Mourning, which you also had uh, in this book. I had never heard that one before, and we're and this was in. Uh, he was, it was from Charlotte. So it was before Miami traded for him, which is right. like, man, you want to talk about twin towers. Um, so you, you just said it, you didn't get to talk to Riley. You didn't get to talk to, um, Nelson. It seems like you did talk to Jeff and Gundy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he, although he, he had cold feet for a minute too, which really rare because, um, you know, you guys got him for, for one of your anniversary episodes or yep. you know, anniversary, but a threshold episode that you had, um, wonderful guy in terms of just talking to the media. We'll talk to just about anybody, you know, um, some of the lower level blogs and stuff like that, which I think is wonderful. Yes. Same way I try to operate. You just people are a fan of you and want to talk to you. You know, why, why wouldn't you? So he, he does that. He and I have known each other for years as far as just like talking to each other. I've interviewed him several times. Always been helpful. Always been accessible. Um, but he got cold feet. And the reason he got cold feet when I wanted to talk to him is that he said, Chris, you know, I had introduced myself to him in person for one of the first times at the finals in Oakland several years ago um, when I first started the book. I wanted to do that with all the key figures to let them know kind of who I am, what I look like, okay. what I'm trying to do, just to show up good faith. Did it with Patrick when he came to Chicago for uh, for the lottery, the Zion lottery. Oh, okay. um, but with Jeff, he had said, I'm more than happy to talk to you. I've talked to you before. Trust you. Glad you're doing this. I think it'll be great. When I actually called him about a year later, a year and a half later, he said, you know, Chris, I, I know what I said. Um, but I'm not sure if I should do this anymore. And I said, Jeff, what, what changed? You know who I am. You trust me. What, what's going on here? He said, and keep in mind the timeline. You remember at the very beginning of the pandemic, Oakley was just kind of skewering Patrick at every opportunity. Oh. Um, yeah. And Jeff basically said that time was too great and too good a time in my life. The memories were too great to diminish that. And if it's just going to be people slinging mud at each other throughout your book, I, I don't, I don't, like I, I would rather kind of cherish that time. It was a great time in my life. And I said, Jeff, I don't give a damn about the sniping that's happening after the fact. Uh, mm-hmm. I think most of us can kind of see where it comes from and why he's doing it, why Oakley's doing it. But I'm also not like, look, I'm not turning a blind eye to valid criticisms or dislikes or hatred that people have for each other. But I'm not you've, you've seen my work before. You've been part of my work before. Um, I'm really not interested in that. You but. For you, like, I think you're one of the central figures of the era. Um, I'm losing something in a book that is going to sit on the shelves forever if I don't have you in this book. So I'm, I'm not, I mean, I can't f- twist your arm, but like, I'm really not interested in that. And you will have some people that disagree. You will have some people that have feelings about folks, but that is not even something I'm really addressing in the book. I think I have one sentence about Oakley and why he was frustrated with Ewing in the epilogue. Yeah, at the you wrote it. The book. Yeah. Um, but other than that, I didn't care. I mean, like, it, it's kind of clear where it comes from. And, you know, so anyway, Van Gundy agreed to talk to me. We talked probably three or four times. Um, and I had so many people that were willing to talk to me so many times for this book. Um, I think all told it was like 640 hours of interviews that I had um, on tape and, you know, 204, 205 people. Um, but a lot of that was repeat people, uh, not repeat people, but just in terms of the hours and stuff that I'm talking about a lot of them talked to me for 10, 15 hours um, just because there's so much stuff and so long to go through and so much context that was necessary to, to make sure I was telling the story the right way. But it's, it's interesting because that to me relates right to what you were saying before about Jeff, Jeff's uh, concern that he vocalized because to me, I, I don't think anyone, I don't care if you hate the Knicks more than anything, no one who reads this book won't come away feeling like this was something very special um, that was in place during this time, even though they didn't, they obviously didn't win the championship. Um, And again, that's a credit to you to how you, I mean, again, you're not, you're not um, blowing smoke up anyone's ass. It's just, you, you, it, it was not easy to stay on top of the league or near the top of the league for an entire decade through multiple coaches. And again, with only one player there the whole time, just Patrick Ewing. And then the rest of the cast kind of goes in and out um, and they managed to do it. So I I do think it is a love letter to the nineties Knicks. So I think you um, assuaged uh, Jeff's concern. I, I, again, maybe that's the story has been out there, uh, but I had never heard it before about how 
there was another coach at one of uh, Jeff's, I think it was his first, first coaching job um, that couldn't understand why Jeff Van Gundy was always beating him to the office. And uh, as the former you tell it, coach, that's Stu Jackson. That's right. Yes. There you go. Stu Jackson. Um, and that is because he was uh, literally living in his office. He was sleeping on his couch because he hadn't got his apartment situated yet. Um, I, I just came away from this, uh, you know, and, and you focus on Van Gundy more on like the last hundred pages or so. Um, he seemed to be the right coach for the team at that time. And I'm not sure that there could have been any, and you, and you go through all the different names that, that maybe were, were in the running. And obviously you go through all the Phil stuff and the, the secret meeting and, and all that. Um, I'm not sure anybody could have done it the way Jeff did it um, in those, in those last years. Do you, do you agree with that? I think there was one name that maybe could have gotten there. And I do harp on it for about three, four paragraphs, maybe more. Um, and that Don Nelson chapter, I basically say Don Nelson was not their first choice. And I mentioned Chuck Daly, Chuck Daly. was their first choice. Yeah. Chuck Daly, I feel like with a lot of hard breakups, and, and Riley was obviously a hard breakup for the Knicks, you, you either go for the, the person that is most like your ex <laughs> um, and not your ex, or you go yeah. for the person that is like definitely not your ex to yeah. prove a point. Now, maybe not to prove a point, but like you do it and it's like a complete 180. Chuck Daly was probably as close as you get to Riley. Like he kind of seemed like Riley without the kind of craziness that we're talking about. Yeah. Like a really dignified looking coach who coached a really physical system that had a lot of veterans on his team that had all the respect in the world from players from other teams. He was the dream team coach. So like he has about as much respect as anybody and Patrick liked him because of that. Um, so they were trying very hard to close the deal with him. And um, Chuck Daly's wife was not really of the opinion that Chuck should go back into coaching. Um, Chuck was a little bit concerned about the way Riley was treated on the way out. Maybe mm -hmm. it was after he was actually out that, you know, he had people going in pretty hard, including the media on Pat for the way he left and, you know, obviously Pat again left under terms that were kind of nebulous. So I, I understand that, but that was a concern for Chuck Daly where he was like, you know, if that's what they're doing to Pat, it was like an all time great coach. Like what, you know, what if something happens with me? So anyway, I say all that to say this, the, the story that comes up in the book, which I tried to get out of the way with, when people told stories like this, I do this with the NBA finals chapter in the game seven with Starks with a key detail. I do it here as well. Anytime someone prominent enough or relevant enough to a conversation brought up something that was like a clear dissenting point of view that was actually rooted in something, I sought to include it because to me, if it's he said, he said, I'm not sure who's telling the truth necessarily. I might have thoughts, but it's relevant if it's like a high ranking person saying it and if they remember it a certain way. So I say all that to say this Norm Scott, the team doctor who was a really good friend of Chuck Daly's because he was also the dream team doctor. Um, he remembered Chuck interviewing. He's really good friends with Chuck. Chuck Daly turns the Knicks job down publicly um, because the Knicks kind of had this thing where when they offered a job, they would say, you've got 48 hours before we start talking to other people. They did it to Riley. They did it to Chuck Daly. So Chuck Daly has his two days. The second day, he says, no, thank you. He writes out a long statement explaining why he didn't take the job. Um, the way it was told to me by Norm Scott, the team doctor, is that Chuck Daly, either the next day or maybe at most 48 hours later, circles back and says, actually, I made a huge mistake turning this job down. I still want it. Is it available? And the way it was told to me by Norm Scott is that the Knicks essentially said no. And that basically, um, that, you know, I, I said, OK, well, who told you that? Did Chuck Daly tell you that? He's like, no, no, no. Ernie Grunfeld told me that the GM of the team told me that. And he told me like a month after it happened, I was like, wow. I asked Ernie Grunfeld the same question. He does acknowledge that Chuck at some point circled back and said that he had regrets about turning the job down. But Ernie says it wasn't a month and a half later that I told him that it was like a year and a half later. And it was like, a, I told him that right after Chuck Daly told me that he'd made a mistake. Chuck Daly did not circle back a day or two later because Chuck was really the guy we wanted. If he'd circled back, we would have hired him. So I, I understand, and I'm willing to give Ernie the benefit of the doubt there, but the fact that Norm Scott, he's like a sharp guy, he's a doctor. 
Uh, yeah. He's been around for several years. He's also friends with Chuck Daly. So I kind of feel like that's not a story he would get wrong, but I also can understand that Ernie probably remembers that. And I do fundamentally believe that like that was the guy they wanted. So if Chuck did circle back at the 11th hour, part of me feels like it probably wouldn't have been too late. So I'm not sure what's the truth, but I felt like both were important to include. Um, So anyway, to your initial question, I think Chuck is a guy that like, he fit enough of those things. Defense had the respect of a ton of players, star players. He'd coached, I guess not in a big market necessarily. He'd coached in New Jersey right before. So he had coached in a bigger market. Um, Not, you know, with the pressure of coaching the Knicks necessarily, but I think he could have worked. And I think that, you know, Van Gundy, I'm not sure what happens to him at that point. But yeah, I think that's an interesting Chuck question. Daly yeah. could have worked. I, I, you know, and I think they would have had enough of the same DNA, in my opinion, if they'd gotten Chuck Daly. But aside from that, I don't know who you get because I yeah. think Jeff was the closest thing you were going to get to to Pat. Yeah, and it was, um, you know, and and I, I feel bad. I didn't even spend. Again, there's so much that we are not going to get to. Uh, so if you're listening to this and like, oh, I feel like I'm hearing so much of the book, we're covering like two percent of the book. Um, <laughs> I I don't want to keep you for too too long. So you know, it's it's a good transition because you you tell you know the the ninety six ninety seven season. Obviously, the suspensions you go through all of that, and ni- kind of ninety seven ninety eight and like, and then you get into ninety nine and. 99 is a season that like a lot of fans my age, you know, I'm, I'm 38. So I was, um, you know, you could do the math. Like I was a a teenager at the time, like we glorify that year to a degree that I can't even put into words. Like uh, there's a book about that season too. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a season unlike any other, Um, but you get into the nitty gritty of it, which is that, well, actually it was like a season from hell and it was a season from hell in a lot of ways. And it went wrong in, I don't know, by just every way possible, but like you go through some of the scores from that season. And I've looked at these scores, but again, the way you tell it really brings it to life. Where like, I think you said they, there was one game in, uh, I forget where it was, but they had like 30 something Chicago. points. Going into, Chicago. That's they right. Had, they had five points in one quarter against Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. And 30 I mean, something points. After they've fourth. lost Michael Jordan, Scotty, Rodman, yes. and, and Bill. So it's like you're scoring five points against like a high school team. Yeah. Which calls itself the Bulls. Yeah. yeah. And, and and like you tell all these all these great stories from that season. Um, and then you get to the playoffs and and you go through it, and it really does, you know, it puts it into context in a way where it's like, my God, you could replay that a hundred times. And I don't know, but at the same time, it's like, and you write this, you're like, they weren't that mismatched with Miami. Like they knew when they looked across the the hallway at Miami, they're like, okay, it's us. Like we don't care that they're one and we're eight, you know, and then obviously the sweep against the Hawks and then, and then what happened against Indiana. Um, It really, it was, it just, it left. That was my, I think the Riley stuff was probably my favorite part of the book, but the 99 stuff was special. and then I, I, before I let you go, I have, I, I, I want to just say, I'm bringing this up for anybody who's going to get mad at me. I, this is not, it, it's, I, I have to bring this up because you put it in the book and it's good. And I, I think he's gone away and I don't think he's involved with the team anymore, but you write a little bit about Dolan and you tell some stories about Dolan after he bought the team. And specifically again, during that 99 season, when Dolan comes in, he's a new owner, and he basically decides we are going to fire either Jeff Van Gundy um, or Ernie Grunfeld. And he puts this on Checkets and kind of leaves it for Checkets to decide. But then, um, and I love, I as a longtime Sopranos fan, I really appreciated uh, the way you wrote this. <laughs> 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 so there's there's like a they, they they went on a like there was initial conversations about one of them has to get fired and then I guess I had never heard of this person before I probably should have Lust Garden uh, is the guy's last name who was like Dolan's he died of cancer so he hasn't been around for a while okay yeah okay yeah. but he so was he's like higher it's a higher up there yeah. a higher up yes he was he worked under Dolan um so you say check its phone rang again it was Lust Garden Jimmy wants it to be Ernie. Lost Garden said in a line that sounded straight out of the Sopranos. Um, and then I, there's a little bit more. So you go on to tell there's a little bit of a back and forth. Then check it says Lost Garden explained Dolan had become highly annoyed with how Grunfeld's wife, Nancy, 
carried herself inside the arena celebrity lounge, Suite 200. He thinks she acts way too much like she's the queen of New York and controlling that room, Les Garden said. He doesn't like how she acts. <laughs> Dumbfounded that Grunfeld's wife would carry any weight in such a key decision. <laughs> All I cared about was wins. What gives us the best chance to win? Check it said. You press the other questions. Why was ownership meddling? Yada, yada, yada. And you just, it just paints a picture of like, here's this guy. What was Dolan? Like 40 at the time? I don't even know if he was 40 years old. Yeah, I'm not sure. But somewhere probably. In somewhere range, around yeah. there. Who comes in and it's like, here is this. And you, you, you wrote 260 pages about it this like ultra successful organization. And he comes in here and within, I don't know, however many months on the job is like just absolutely tearing stuff up. And yeah. What was, uh, what was it like getting to the, the Dolan stuff towards the end there? I can still remember we're talking about three years ago when I announced this book deal. So it's probably, you know, about a little bit more than three years when I was proposing this book to these different publishing houses that were interested in it. And, um, I think at least two of them asked me like, how much of a book are you planning to make about Dolan? And I was like, hopefully none, you know, like that's what I kept thinking because to me, the reason I feel that way, everybody else, Riley, Ewing, Mason, Oakley, Starks, Charles Smith, check it's everybody has so much nuance to them. And I imagine that a great writer will find that nuance within Dolan. And I'd like to think of myself as being good at what I do, but man, I didn't feel like searching that hard for it. And um, like what that nuance was, because I feel like every story you hear about the guy is kind of like the one you just told, where it's like, why the hell is he focused on the wife? Like Grunfeld's wife, what does that have to do with anything? So to me, it's not that I wasn't willing to kind of dig a little bit, but for me, Dolan had just become the owner of the team. Yep. And because I was making the book about 91 to 99, he gets more and more entrenched with the decision making later on. And I think you can see the book trending in that direction. But it's like I he gets most involved and stuff goes most off the rails after the period I'm writing about. I figured, you know, let's end on a note where they're in the finals, where they have a chance, but they don't win, which is kind of fitting for them with the way they played in that era. Um and then let the rest of the story tell itself. You've, you've set up the trajectory for what's happening with Dolan. Dave Checkett spells it out a couple of times, like that he worried that this was kind of a sign that Dolan was encroaching on kind of what management would generally do and kind of taking decisions out of the man, management's hands. So to me, I just didn't really have an interest in, um, like I don't like writing about people that don't have enough gray to them as opposed to black and white. And there's like a lot of black and white with Dolan that's just kind of like, you know, the, the, the phrase I keep using is cartoonish. Like I, with Mason, I refuse to make him a cartoon. I, I really wanted to humanize him and, and layer the story. Thank you. Um, I was, you know, I was texting, calling people in Mason's orbit today, just to let them know the book is out. You know, don't want you to be blindsided, but also hope that you can see the amount of care I try to put into telling the story with Dolan. It was kind of the same thing, but it's like, I know there's a layered portrait with Mason. I'm not sure exactly what you come, like what, things you find with Dolan like that. And if there are some, then that's like for me to uncover. I think it would have been more for me to uncover if I did like the next 20 years of the dynasty, because he's been the owner that whole time. Then you have to get into all of it. I knew I was just kind of dipping my toe in the water just to tell enough of what was happening as it related to the team and how it was changing. The team. Again, a period of transition, but it's the, the beginning team. of the end. Like, and, and that's kind of how end. you write it. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, to me, that was the takeaway and showing little bits and pieces of Dolan, it's relevant for that. But I wasn't looking to kill him. And I actually, <laughs> my agent said, why didn't you, you need to be tougher on Dolan. I was like, I'm not even really mentioning him. Others than like three or four times that he got involved in something that he probably had no business getting involved in. That was basically just the one year that that was like his first year in charge. Imagine what it got like when he really fully took over, when check and steps out of the way, when Jeff Van Gundy's not there anymore. And you start thinking about the idea of like the stuff that you've heard over the years of, well, you get in all of it, but like, I, to me, it, it's one of those things where it's like, if you've got a card, if you've got cards, you're trying to do flashcards with a kid and you've got, you know, something that's in order and it's one card's a five, one card's a three. And then you've got a card that's blank. It's like, what's next in the order. Yeah. It's probably going to be a one. Like, you know, that you don't need me to, to spell it all the way out for you. You yeah. can see where it's going. You've seen what the rest of the history of the franchise is. 
and the period that I'm not covering. So it's, you know, the point was to show what worked for the organization and then what changed for it. That was the change. And um, did someone someday will write a book on that. And, uh, you know, I, I, people were saying when I was working on this, you got to do the 2000 and on Knicks now, you know, like the 2000 to 2020 Knicks. I was like, no, I don't. Cause no, I'm just, not doing that. Just sell a, <laughs> sell a bottle of scotch. Uh, it'll, it'll, it's the same. <laughs> that will go yeah. bestseller a lot faster than that book. will. but some people want to read about the car crash stuff. That's what the, the shattered podcast did, you know, yeah. is that they looked into kind of like what's happened. And I'm like, I, yeah, maybe for a pocket series, it works. Uh, I have no interest in doing a book on that to the extent that I did one on this one. I'd rather write about something that was working and then how it fell apart as opposed to something that is only falling apart. And I, I don't even know back the other. Like who would want to write that? I mean, I'm sure there are people who would want to write that book, but like, I, that, I don't, I don't know. Um, maybe a person and it's really twice as long as a period I just wrote about, like, I'm not interested in that at all. Not at all. Yeah. Um, there's just not enough levity there. Enough intrigue to, to hold my attention as a writer. So no matter what I do, no matter how great you think I am, I'm not going to be able to hold people's attention for that long. And and by the way, you end this book on a high note. You mentioned last year, you mentioned Tom Thibodeau, you mentioned getting back to the nineties kind of ethos. You mentioned, I think you even mentioned that they were like fourth in defensive rating last year. It would be great to be fourth again this year. Um, but like, yeah, no, you, you, you end on, you end on a high note. Um, and it's just, you know, I, gosh, there's so much, uh, I, I mean, I keep here for hours, but like, I, I actually, here's the last thing I'm going to ask you, uh, sure. two, two last things. Uh, one, what player do you think readers who, I don't know, maybe they were a fan of the team. Maybe they've never, maybe they never watched the team. Maybe they're like 18 years old. Um, what player do you think people will come away feeling the most attachment to for, for me, I think, think it's Mason because again, I don't know, maybe you thought you were being hard. I just thought it was, it was layered and it was complex and it was real. Like I didn't, I mean, look, you mentioned the stuff that needs to be mentioned about Mason, but I don't think this, I don't come away like, Oh, Anthony Mason was a bad dude from reading this book. That's my answer. I'm curious if you have a different answer. I, no, I think it's Mason because I think people already love John Starks. Um, I don't think that's a question. I think people have grown to realize that they need to love Patrick Ewing in a way that maybe they didn't before. Um, And I think some fans have always loved him. So it's not to say everybody's like that. I think Oakley's interesting uh, just because it seems like the way that he's been received the last few years with some of the stuff that's happened the last few years, it's interesting. Like I didn't realize sometimes I maybe I, I don't take stock of the way you guys feel as fans, but it seems like that's been changing a little bit, but I I think it's um, mixed. Yeah, it's more mixed than it was, but I also think some of that has to do with the stuff with Patrick, you know, and and the fact that he was kind of going after Patrick. But to me, I think Mason is the guy. The other guys were around for longer. Oakley got traded in, you know, 98, ahead of the lockout season. So did Starks. Um, Mason was gone in 96. Uh, Mason didn't really have quite the success that those other guys had. They'd been all-stars with the Knicks. Mason had not. Mason was an all-star later. Yep. After that, once he left the Knicks. So I think it's probably Mason. I also think there's just probably the most curiosity about him because he's gone. Um, so I'd probably say Mason. Uh, yeah, I can't I can't see why it wouldn't be Mason. I, I think he has to be the guy that people feel something about, whether you look at him and he's probably a little bit rougher around the edges than people really know uh, to the point where, you know, one of the pastors I talked to, the chaplain of the team, says that people have gotten in his ear and suggested like, I don't know that you want to deal with Mason or pray with Mason or work with Mason because like, do you know the stuff he's into? And he's like, that's exactly the sort of person that I'm supposed to work with. Like, you know, from a Christian standpoint, like, what are you talking about? But like someone that is perceived to be so rough that like, you can't even go get spiritual help. Like, what is that? What does that even say about you? So yeah, I think Mason's that guy, you know, for me that I, I really wanted to make sure I'd, took time to, to get that right. Hopefully everybody came across fairly and hopefully I got the story right with enough of those guys, but um, that was the goal. And uh, certainly with Mason, it was a huge goal just because he, he doesn't get any opportunity to, to defend himself. And I wanted to make sure I was being really careful there. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Andrew will, will chime in and disagree with me. I don't know of a Nick fan that doesn't hold Mason in, uh, you know, high regard. Uh, for, you know, it's, it's almost because like, I, I don't want to presume, but like, I feel like we've all known an Anthony Mason somewhere in our life. Who's like, 
you know, he's, he's a, at, at his, in his core, he's like a good person who maybe has made some questionable decisions. And that, again, that is the character that comes through. And you kind of just uh, already answered my last question, which is like, what, what do you hope people get from this book? Um, but yeah, I'll ask anyway, what do you, what do you want people to come away from this with? Um, that's a good question. I, you know, I think it's just that you don't have to, I mean, from a book reading standpoint, I'm biased now as an author. Um, you don't have to be in love with a team to enjoy a book. Uh, you know, I think you can hate them and enjoy this book. I think you can enjoy the league and love this book. Um, I certainly wrote it that way. I, I had so much information in there about the Raptors and about the Bulls and certainly about the Heat, about the origin of the Pacers and the fact that Donnie Nelson tried to build the team basically to be the Knicks. I mean, he basically said that yep. at one point, that literally there was one play that, you know, he watched Oakley just lay out Reggie Miller and not get called for a foul. He was like, I need two guys that can do exactly what he just did. And he went because and got the refs are too. Yeah, he did. Basically the, the, the refs were so flustered that basically they, they didn't even think to call a foul. Like they, and got the out of about out of bounds call wrong uh, because they were so kind of just taken aback at what happened. So there's that. Um, there's a lot of interplay with other teams. Like, I feel like if you gave me like a word association game for most of the franchises in the league at that time, I could give you a detail on a team, whether it was in the book or not. And that's what I'm saying is like, I wanted to make sure there was something here for everybody, which is hard. Um, it requires time. It requires kind of stepping back and saying like, how deep in the weeds is this? Um, but I feel like the story moves along a lot. So I just wanted people to kind of see that you don't have to be a champion, an NBA champion, and you know, a team that wins a ring to be worthy of a, a good story. Um, the most watched 30 for 30 is the Fab Five one, which is a yeah. team that fundamentally changed the way we thought about the sport on some level. Yep. Fundamentally changed what we got used to seeing as far as shaved heads, long baggy shorts, you know, it was like kind of iconic in a way, never won a championship stuff came apart before that could happen. Um, but okay, you're, you're going to tell me that they weren't relevant enough to do a documentary or a book on really. Okay. The Knicks were not quite that relevant, I think on a national scale to everyone, but they stood in the way. There were people that had problems with them, just like people had problems with the fab five. Um, and were you know, the way I described it in the book is that they were this forest dump type figure that they were always involved or intertwined with a really important historical moment that we think about with basketball. And, uh, so I, that's just the relevance to like, if you're just a fan and you're not a Knicks fan. So there's that, if you are a Knicks fan, obviously it's relevant. If you're a nineties fan, it's relevant. Um, and they changed that. I keep saying this. I fundamentally think they changed the way the sport was played far more than the bulls did. And granted, that's not what people are judging history on. They're judging it on championships. So I'm, no one's saying they were better. And of course, I'm not saying that. No one's saying that they were necessarily more entertaining. I'm not saying that. Or that people wanted to watch them more. Definitely not saying that. What I'm saying is that when you look at how basketball got to where it is now, with all this skill and all this athleticism, mm -hmm. the league emphasized that and shows that over what the Knicks were doing as the path forward for the league. And they basically said, we're getting rid of anything and everything that has remnants of what those Knicks teams are doing because we don't want for sheer brutality and physicality to overtake the importance of skill. And so Knicks teams like that, they basically made sure that Knicks teams like that will never exist again. Uh, that's history. That, that's a really important part of understanding what happened during the nineties is that they rooted that stuff out. That's what I want people to take from it is that this team was so fascinating that the league had to change the rules because of them. Uh, aside from all how colorful the players and the people were, the league basically said, we cannot have this anymore. We're borderline afraid of the Knicks and what they would do if they allowed them to keep playing this way, the way they did. So that that's what it is for me. And you have, a, you didn't mention it explicitly, but you have a whole section of the book in which you explicitly go through how the league changed the rules in response to the Knicks and how the Knicks were, um, I guess you'd say intimately involved in that process. Uh, the, the, the following season, I won't, I won't get into that because again, if you are listening to this and you feel like you've heard a lot, I, again, less than 5% of what is in this book. Um, I'm just really, this book makes me proud to be an Knicks fan, um, but not as proud as it does uh, that uh, I am a friend of yours. Um, I, I can't believe you did this. 
It's incredible. Thank you so much, buddy. It, it, dude, it's <laughs> it's so good. It's so freaking good. Uh, I can't wait till the the summer comes and I I'll because I'm gonna reread it. Um, I we're gonna any place that we post uh, this show either in podcast form or on the YouTube channel or we tweet it out. Um, we will have a link to the Amazon, right, Andrew? Um, where people could order it if they haven't already pre-ordered it. If you haven't already ordered this thing, uh, what are you doing? Um, but yeah, Chris, I'll just, I'll give you the last word. No, I'm just grateful. I mean, I, this is again, I mean, you guys got me completely emotional. Like I said, this is the first time I've done that in any of this book stuff, uh, for several weeks. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful people love the book. Uh, even if they don't, that's okay. And people have been so supportive. Um, and just know that I, I feel that I, I literally have reached the point where I'm like, I'm trying not to be obnoxious with retweeting people. There, I think there's legitimately too many for me to retweet anyway, because I, I don't want to miss people. Um, so I'm just really, really grateful. Um, this has been a dream come true for me. And uh, I just keep imagining how proud my parents would be. And, uh, and so I really, really, really appreciate the platform that you guys offered and allowed and, and everybody else. And just, um, just super, super grateful and thankful that the fan base has always embraced me like this. And it, I don't know how, I don't know why or what I've ever done to really deserve that, but uh, I'm just super, super appreciative. So thank you so much for giving me an opportunity. Cause you're a good guy and you're pretty good at writing. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Herring, uh, author of Blood in the Garden, the flagrant history of the 1990s New York Knicks. If you don't already have it, make sure you get it soon. You won't regret it.